Good afternoon for round two of the nervous system. This is nervous system lecture two, um, which follows the nervous system one, uh, which I prepared earlier today. Um, today, we're, with this lecture, we're gonna focus on the brain. And hopefully you guys remember, or if you had a chance to look at it, with the first lecture, focus on kind of a general introduction to the nervous system, the cells, how it generally operates, the, some of the terminology. Like I said, today we're gonna to focus on the brain for this lecture on Wednesday, excuse me. We'll focus on the spinal cord and um, the autonomic nervous system, hopefully. And I'll also have a review packet, um, review sheet, study guide for you guys on Wednesday. Um, and like I said, later today, I'll have the lab exams all graded. So, all right, so here we go. Let's see, hold on a second here. All right, so today we're gonna to focus on the brain with this lecture and just a little information about it. There we go. Um, obviously you're familiar with this view before you've seen the brain. One of the things we know about the brain, of course, is that it's made up of several different, what we call cerebral hemispheres. Now there's several parts to the brain. What I wanna start off talking about is the telencephalon. And the telencephalon is this very recognizable area with all the folds. And this is divided up into very general regions, different lobes. And some of the names of the lobes you'll recognize based upon what we covered with the skull. First lobe is the frontal lobe. You remember the frontal bone. Second lobe is the parietal lobe. Remember the parietal bone. The area in between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe is what we call the central sulcus. We then have what's called the occipital lobe. The area between the occipital lobe and the parietal lobe is called the parietal occipital sulcus. Sulcus is kind of like a groove. And then we also have what's known as the temporal lobe and what's called the lateral sulcus. So those are the different lobes. The focus today is mostly we're going to go into the functions of these different lobes and get into some other regions as well. So when we talk about the lobes, this part, it's called the telencephalon. So as I mentioned, the telencephalon is divided up into four lobes, the frontal, the temporal, the parietal, and the occipital. And functionally, what do we know? Well, generally speaking, this is involved in language, plays a very important role in language, and that's primarily associated with the frontal and the parietal. We'll talk a bit more about that shortly. Um, we also have conscious thoughts, memory and cognition, which is learning, um, auditory and visual, those are some of the senses, obviously and somatosensory. So we've already learned about sensory and motor. Remember I mentioned information comes in by sensory, goes out by a motor. In between that, there's a part of the brain that processes that sensory information before sending it out, like moving your leg, for example. So what are some other re uh, features of the telencephalon? So the telencephalon is divided up, as you know, into two hemispheres. And down the middle of the two hemispheres is a fissure, the longitudinal fissure, which kind of runs the same route as the sagittal suture of the skull. There it is right there. Even though this divides the, the two hemispheres, it's not completely divided. There's actually a connection, a neural connection, these cables that are known as the corpus Corpus callosum. 
Now, one of the things you may have heard of when we're talking about the nervous system, I haven't addressed it yet, is the idea of gray matter and white matter. You've heard that someone when someone says, use your gray matter. So gray matter actually is a reference to the cell bodies and the dendrites of a neuron. And this is primarily located on the outer part of the cerebrum. So if we take a slice through here like this or through here, what we're going to see is this gray matter, which are mostly cell bodies and dendrites. We have another bit of gray matter on the interior. But in between those two, we have white matter, which are myelinated axons. So cell bodies and dendrites, gray matter, sandwiching the white matter, which are the axons. Another characteristic of the um, telencephalon is the folds. And if you take a look, for example, you'll see that these folds, which are typical in most advanced vertebrates, um, are the folds themselves are known as gyri, these peaks, and the grooves in between are the, what are called sulcus, or plural sulci. Right? So the peaks are the gyrus or the gyri, the valleys are the sulci, and then of course we have these long fissures. What can we say about the frontal lobe? So the frontal lobe, as I mentioned before, and we'll divide this into the different parts, the frontal lobe, of course, is separated from the parietal lobe by what's known as the central sulcus. And if we go back here for a second, um, remember, here's the central sulcus, here's the frontal lobe, here's the parietal lobe, so that divides it. What is some of the functions of the frontal lobe? Couple functions. Number one, what we call motor functions. There's a region of the frontal lobe that's called the primary motor cortex. And this is where nerves are going to be leaving the brain, going to specific regions of the body. And you can see this kind of cartoonish looking picture of what we call the motor cortex, which is really a slice from here. It's very distinctly demarcated by this area of the motor cortex is responsible for nerves that go to the hand. This part of the motor cortex consists of nerves that are going to the face. This kind of abnormal looking disproportionate arrangement is called the homunculus. And fortunately, our body does not look anything like, like that. This, would, this is how we would be walking around, right? There's a high proportion of neurons that go to the hand as well as the face. So we have the motor homunculus, neurons going to these different organs. Another function of the frontal lobe is the ability to focus, sometimes what we call focus, decision-making, executive function. Uh, this is a par the part of the brain where people who have ADHD, things like that, um, there may be some issues with that frontal lobe, some sort of developmental feature that interferes with their ability to focus. Another very important part of the frontal lobe is language. Now, there's a couple different parts of language. One is the ability to speak and express ourselves. And then another part of the language is to kind of understand, understand what we're saying, understanding what others are saying. There's an area in the frontal lobe that's called Broca's area, Broca's region. It's only on the left hemisphere that's responsible for the expression of words, our ability to speak. So we'll take a look at a type of condition where there's a damage to that area, and you'll take a look and see how that person, um, their speech is affected. And of course, we have executive function. Um, you, many of you may have heard of Phineas Gage. Um, he was a railroad worker many, many years ago who suffered an injury where um, a metal rod from the railroad work, I'm not sure if they're generating some dynamite explosion, went through his cranium, specifically going through his frontal lobe. And of course, this is not a vital part of the brain, right? This is not a, a um, necessary for life per se, but it affects, you can imagine, language, 
thing and other uh, all these other functions as well. Um, it also affects his mood. And from what I understand, um, but the before and after Phineas Gage, he was was a very nice person. Then he became a very uh, changed individual. So it completely changed his personality. Which I guess, if I had a rod through my skull, I'd probably be messed up too. So. All right, what about the parietal lobe? Parietal lobe is located behind the central sulcus. Um, its main function is sensory perception. So we mentioned the motor function is or nerves that are leaving the frontal lobe going to specific organs, whether it's the gut, whether it's the arms, legs, skin, other areas. The area where neurons coming in, sensory neurons enter, they enter into the sensory homunculus, which is in the parietal lobe. So touch, pressure, pain, all these different things are perceived in this area. Sometimes called the, the sensory homunculus. Homunculus is re reference to like a human, like homo sapiens, homunculus. So input and then output through the frontal lobe. Um, language is also important here, and there's a region called Wernicke's area, which is the ability to comprehend speech. So people who have uh, this area affected, they have no problem speaking, but whether you can understand them or they can understand you is um, adversely affected. All right, so what do we know so far? We know we've got the primary motor cortex in the frontal lobe the sensory cortex in the parietal lobe. And the regions just on either side of that central sulcus are called gyrus, right? Peaks and valleys. This is called the post-central gyrus. This is called the pre-central gyrus. Then we have, of course, what we call the cerebral processing areas, which is what I referred to when we were talking about Broca's area, which is in the frontal lobe. And then we have Wernicke's area, which is usually in the left hemisphere. 90, 95% of the time, it's found in the left lobe. Um, that can change, uh, rarely, but 95% of the time, it's found in the left lobe. All right, so I'm going to show you guys a couple quick videos of condition known as aphasia. Aphasia has to do with um, a pathology that affects speech. In this first example, this individual has Broca's aphasia, where this area was affected. They can understand language, but they can't articulate. So for example, let's take a look at this here. Hopefully this will work. Uh, let's see, here we go. Fellow who likes to walk. Oh, jeez. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> 
And it's getting too cold. Yeah. To run your John Deere tractor, isn't it? Yeah. Up yeah. and downtown. Yeah. What did the doctor tell you, Jack? Don't know. He doesn't know what's going on. No. Huh? No. Did you feel sick in any other way? No. 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 Uh. uh Ache. Yeah. Legs uh, ached. Yeah. Uh. Did you feel weak? No. 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 Uh, Maybe you had a touch of rheumatism. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let's go back. Oops. Oops. That's not what I wanted to do here. All right. Resume slideshow. Okay, next thing I wanna show is Wernicke's area. Wernicke's aphasia, rather. This is, and you'll see the dramatic difference. There's a, you know, <laughs> What's this? You know, there's a right there. All right, end of the football. End of the football? And so it's the football right here. Cause and it comes in, see? Yeah. The end of it. Yeah. Oh, we got a lot of things, see? I don't understand. Well, it's, uh, well, it's pliable in the other, see? You don't understand it, but it's the product in that long, clear reed coming from the head. And it comes, sorry, from the country, how to do it, see? All the other, see, it comes up. Finally, come out here and goes out. Get it? Sort of. Yeah, it comes out here. See, it comes out here, 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 and, and here. Uh -huh. And it comes in, uh -huh. and it comes out, and bing. That's a good flow, see. That's a good what? That, that's a good, good flow, 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 see, it flows cold, or it gives, it kicks out, or bing, or whatever it is. It, we has no football to put it out. It's just pulling, see? But they say she alert. Oh, I guess you maybe you have beds. See, I don't know. <laughs> Where do you live? Where do you live? You're in your live? You're up here, see? Where do you live, Doc? Where do you live? Where do you live? Where do you live? Yes, uh, well, if there's a running trailer here, I'm here. You? You used to be a dentist. Yes. Where? Right here. <laughs> the rest of the hearing, yes. And how many years were you a dentist? How many? Holy Christmas. Oh, about, uh, about a hundred and, let's see, a hundred and, about 40. Gosh, but there is one, uh, one plus five. Wait a minute, no. It's a pretty high class to get it, get it this one day. <laughs> it's fine if it is off, see. It's cause, or it goes for, the, for about uh, over 30. Are one thirty per dog. So you spend for Oscar, Oscar, Sir Oscar, it's less than against her, and then he comes back to the other Sir four, and then goes out for the rest of the time. There is a Nazi some with the soldiers, where they have the soldiers and the soldiers, and the suburbs, and all the first suburbs, and watch out in the short time, and the uh, and they class with the sugar, two, two hours, two, I learned, oh, wow, wow, these are terrible words. <laughs> these are terrible words. They yeah, sure are. It's hard? <laughs> yes. What, do you, what you're saying? Yeah, that's they make, that's what they do. They, they actually don't allow to do it. It's when they, 
harder and harder to go. And then, then when they go out, finally they quit, see? You have to have a time, don't you? Do I have time? You, you, no, uh, you quick, you quick you out of them. Get, get her, see? It's a, it's a heck of an average, it really was. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So hopefully you guys caught that video. It's interesting. Um, let's just move on. Okay. So moving on to the temporal and occipital lobes. Temporal lobe is involved in storage of auditory and olfactory sensations, right? So auditory is what? Auditory is hearing. Olfactory is sense of smell. Occipital lobe, the back of the brain is where the primary visual cortex, this is where our images are projected. I like to think of it as almost like an IMAX screen, projecting it from the front all the way to the back. So that's all we have to say about the telencephalon. A um, Couple more things, a little bit more about it, um, and then we'll move on. Um, this is just another view of the gray and white matter. Here's a nice view of the gray matter on the outside as well as on the inside. And then all this white matter. White matter, remember I mentioned, are um, myelinated fibers. I like to think of it as like a cable to send information to different parts of the brain. And there's three types of fibers, three types of cables. The association, the commissural, and the projection. What do we know about that? Well, first of all, the association fibers, the white matter, is responsible for sending information from one, from one area of, say, one hemisphere to another area of the same hemisphere. So, for example, from the right frontal lobe to the right parietal lobe. Those are association fibers. Then we have the commissural fibers, which an example is the corpus callosum, which communicates between the two opposite hemispheres. Still white matter, still cables, still myelinated axons. The third one are the projection fibers, and these send information from the cerebrum or the telencephalon to other parts of the brain and spinal cord. So for example, from the frontal lobe, you can send it to maybe the cerebellum, or the pons or other areas that we haven't spoken about yet. So there's a lot of communication, different ways, local versus distant. All right, next thing I wanna talk about is the diencephalon. And the diencephalon is more some of these internal parts of the brain. They consist of the hypothalamus, which is this area right here in blue. The thalamus, Hypo means under, right? So this is the hypothalamus, this is the thalamus. And then just above that, we have what's called the epithalamus, or just above the thalamus, also known as the pineal gland. Many of you guys have heard of these before, I'm sure. The di, the, um, oh, let me back up for a second, sorry about that. So what do we know about functions? The pineal gland's main function is the production of melatonin for regulating our circadian rhythms, our sleep-wake cycles. That's the role of the pineal gland. The thalamus, the function of the thalamus, it's a relay station for sensory information coming in. So remember I mentioned earlier, in the parietal lobe, we have that sensory homunculus. Well, those nerve fibers have to first pass through the thalamus to get to those 
fibers to get to that region in the parietal lobe. That's why it's known as a re sensory relay station. Hypothalamus is very small. It has a variety of, of autonomic functions, visceral functions, for example, like appetite, hunger, uh, well, same thing, appetite, thirst, anger, um, sexual arousal, things like that. And I realized I left out a slide, but anyway, that's all you need to know. From the diencephalon, let's go to the mesencephalon, which is the midbrain. That's what mes means. And there's two parts of it I want to talk about. One are known as the cerebral penduncles, which are these right here, these green areas. So if we go back kind of to what area we're at, all right, so right, right now we're in this area down here, the what we call the midbrain. The cerebral penduncles consists of nerve fibers that are part of what we call the descending tract that are carrying information down the spinal cord from the brain. That's these areas. So descending motor, meaning from the brain down the spinal cord and eventually out to some other effector organ. We then have these two interesting structures. These actually there's two sets of them, these two upper ones and these two lower ones, which you can also see here. And this is an actual brain right here as well. Collectively, the whole group, there's four of them, right? One, two, three, four, are called the corpora quadrigemina. Individually, these two are known as the superior colliculi and the inferior colliculi. Superior colliculi are important for visual reflexes, and the inferior colliculi are important for auditory reflexes. So what does that mean? We already mentioned that visual cortex is in the back of the brain, and that's where we actually the images are projected, right? But the reflexes here are referring to, for example, visual reflexes are when you see something that attracts your attention and you turn your head. Auditory reflexes are when you say, for example, someone's playing music on the left, on the left and you turn your head to the left, just it's automatic. So these are turning our head in response to visual or auditory stimulus. The back part of the brain is the rhombencephalon. Let me go back here for a second. So this again is the telencephalon, right? This is the diencephalon. This is the mesencephalon. And this area down here, as well as this, is the rhombencephalon. It consists of several parts, it's also known as the hind brain. The rhombencephalon consists of the metencephalon, which is also known as the cerebellum, which li literally means little brain. This is important for motor coordination. All right, so we all kind of take it for granted when you walk down the street, you move your right, alternating right and left legs, you swing your arms, very coordinated, right? Well, without the cerebellum, our movements would be much more choppy and irregular. So the cerebellum is responsible for what we call motor coordination of our muscles, smoothing it out, not initiating the movement, but ensuring that it's smooth. This cerebellum consists, much like the cerebrum, this is actually from another animal, you can tell there's not as many folds. Remember the cerebrum is connected by the corpus callosum, the cerebellum is connected by the vermis that allows communication between the two sides. The other part of the metencephalon is the pons. That is this area. It's also going to be this area. It's called the pons. Um, oops, plays an important, it's a relay center. Remember the relay center for sensory information was the thalamus. We have another relay center that conveys information between the cerebellum and the spinal cord, as well as other regions. So it's kind of like also a relay center, the pons is. But more importantly, it actually plays a very important role in breathing. Now, 
if you had damage to your pons, you would still be breathing, but your breathing would be very irregular. So it influences how fast or how slow, how deep or how shallow we breathe. By way of two distinct areas, we have the pneumotaxic region and the apneustic region. Those are two regions within the pons that are responsible for regulating the actual process of breathing, which actually occurs in the medulla. The medulla is actually where the main breathing center. If you had damage to the medulla, depending on what part of it, you could actually stop breathing. So the pons influences or regulates it. The medulla is responsible for initiating it. So let's take a look at the medulla. All right, um, so it connects the brain and the spinal cord, right? There's the brain, there's the spinal cord. Um, it regulates the, re it's, when I say regulates, it, what I really should say is that initiates. So breathing is initiated, the process of initiation is through the medulla, but it has a much broader role. Not only is our breathing function um, initiated, but also it influences our cardiac function, response to blood pressure changes, the medulla responds to regulate it. Also some other visceral functions, swallowing, coughing, sneezing, and vomiting centers. That whole kind of visceral response is due to neural connections within the medulla, medulla obligata. So this is what you would call, obviously, I mean, all parts of the brain are important, but there are certain things that are, um, you know, life dependent, that, that our overall function, life function is dependent. And all animals, whether or not they have a large cerebellum or not, um, they definitely have a very well-developed region down here. Another important part of the brain here is, is called the pyramidal decussation. And that will become much more evident oops, next time when we talk about the spinal cord. But you may have heard of someone, you may have known of someone that's had a stroke on the left side of their brain and it affects, it's on the right, but it affects the movement on the left. That's because there's nerves that cross over in the medulla. That's called the pyramidal decussation. Neurons cross over. Now, another functional part of the brain, not necessarily a specific like region per se, because it encompasses a lot of things, is what's called the limbic system. The limbic system is a collection of structures from the brain that all work to process emotion and memory. One of them is, you've heard of, the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is part of the diencephalon, but it also is component of the limbic system. We have the olfactory bulb. The olfactory bulb is this structure that where um, olfactory information from your nose goes up through that kind of window in the blood-brain barrier, goes through here, travels to this region, right? You, we're, most of you, I'm sure, are very well familiar the relationship between smelling and memory. How many times have you been somewhere where a certain smell evokes a certain feeling? Maybe you had an experience a while back, positive or negative, and there is that smell that was present in the environment at the time. Um, so the olfactory bulb processes odors. The amygdala is involved in emotion. Motion can be anger, fear, all sorts of different forms of emotion. Then finally, we have the hippocampus, which is the formation of memory. So if you take a look here, we've got several interesting things. We've got smell. We've got, obviously, the hypothalamus, along with the amygdala, is involved in emotions and things. Um, we've got the, so we got smell, we've got memory, and we've got emotions. Those three components work together, right? What are the things that we remember most, the things that give us, that evoked, a strong response, whether sadness, happiness, right? That's all part of emotion. And structurally, all this stuff, all these different organs are very close. There's the amygdala, 
There is the hippocampus. This is all part of the hypothalamus. And then there is the um, olfactory bulb. So all very close, the limbic system. All right, what I want to mention, oops, next, sorry about that, just checking to see, is um, when we take a look at the brain, if you were to do surgery or just look at an anatomic, at a sheet brain, which we would normally do in lab, you would find that it's covered by a layer of tissue known as meninges. This is connective tissue. These meninges surround the brain and the spinal cord, but now we're talking about the brain. There's three layers. The outermost layer is known as the dura mater. This is the toughest layer. It's called dura literally means tough, literally means tough mother. The innermost layer, which is the area that is in contact with the brain itself, is called the pia mater, which literally means soft or delicate mother. In between that, we have what's called the arachnoid, which if you think of like arachno, arachnophobia, it's related to spiders because it kind of has a web-like appearance to it. We mentioned before about the ependymal cells, right, that produce cerebral spinal fluid, right? Well, the cerebral spinal fluid flows in a region known as the subarachnoid space, which is between the arachnoid and the pia mater. So let's take a look at this. Um, so this is, you can see, kind of a, a transverse cut, not a trans, well, actually a coronal cut to the brain. This outer layer, this is the dura mater. You can actually see it up there. This, there's actually two parts to the dura mater. There's a dura mater. This kind of a bluish layer here, which is actually this spidery layer right here is the arachnoid, the tissue. The space where the web is, so this dark area is called the subarachnoid space, but these kind of a spidery web structures are the arachnoid. So we've got the dura, the arachnoid, the subarachnoid space, and finally right in contact with the brain, that's the pia. The cerebral spinal fluid flows right through here. And this is just kind of another view of it. Here is the dura mater. Here is the, remember I mentioned there's two parts to it, the outer layer, the inner layer. Then we've got the arachnoid. And then this space is the subarachnoid space. This area right there. And then there's the pia. This is kind of a neat diagram that I wanted to show you to kind of bring everything together. Um, I mentioned related to cerebral spinal fluid. Remember I mentioned flows through the subarachnoid space. Well, that's only part of it. So to start from the get-go, the, the um, cerebral spinal fluid is produced by ependymal cells that are located right around here, right? Now, where does it flow? It flows through a series of what we call ventricles, these tubes. It starts off by flowing first through the lateral ventricle, which are these. Then it flows through the third ventricle. You can see right where it says there. And you can kind of follow the numbers. So lateral ventricle, then third ventricle. You might wonder, where's the first and second? Well, the first and second are the lateral ventricle. So cerebral spinal fluid is produced by ependymal cells as part of the choroid plexus in the lateral ventricles. It flows through there, in through the third ventricle, then eventually it flows into what's called the cerebral aqueduct. You can see it right there. This is the cerebral aqueduct. So lateral ventricle, third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct. And then finally into the fourth ventricle, which is this area right here. So lateral ventricle, third ventricle, aqueduct, and fourth. 
And then from there, it flows down through the spinal cord and then eventually makes its way through, like I mentioned before, the subarachnoid space. So that's kind of the flow of it. You can follow the arrows. All right, so that takes us to the end of this lecture. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and pause it and we'll put this on YouTube a little bit. All right, have a great day and I'll see you on Wednesday.